Sometimes you find what you're looking for, and other times you get far more than you ever bargained for. As we headed north in Scotland, we stopped on a lonely dirt road to turn at an old and barely visible overgrown gate and then down a path just visibly leading to a wood. As we turned from the idyllic hills in the distance, the path before us led onwards in the search for an ornate, lost, final resting place of a forgotten and enigmatic lady who once owned the lands all around us. The rarely told story of her life and how she came to be here in the middle of nowhere is a fascinating tale of a woman living out of step with her time, misunderstood and mysterious to this day. The lady of this wood was a reclusive and very religious woman who loved animals. She lived with many birds, dogs, some tame foxes, and a pet deer named George, who followed her around and ate bread and milk from her hand. In her day, she was seen as strange and is remembered for her quirks more than her deeds. She never married and was a recluse, though she was considered very attractive even until an old age. No painting was ever made of her but she likely looked much like her mother pictured here or her sister. She was to live all alone in a massive Gothic mansion she had built on top of her family's 1750s villa that was built by her father. Her brother, the Earl, had then expanded it in stages in 1808 using famous architect David Hamilton and then James Gillespie Graham. When he died, without a male heir, she inherited the vast estates and continued constantly adding to it with a reverence for feudal buildings, creating a wild, gothic Victorian church-like mansion with a chapel, a tower, the second largest stained glass window in a British house, many suits of armor, chandeliers, an oriental drawing room, a huge 50 by 30 foot hall, crenellated towers, and a bedroom with a Cupid and Psyche theme. The lands all around had coal mines, farms, and other operations that she managed while personally overseeing the construction. Due to her strong will, complete freedom, lack of a husband, and her reclusiveness, many rumors in high society spoke of her imagined scandals. However, she was known to be generous, especially with her estate's families, giving them free coal for heating. Her animals, like George, were treated much like people, and when they died, they were buried in their own plots. In time, as she retreated into solitude, she was to claim the new house was raised under bad and awful auspices, and that her dog would howl in the most dreadful manner in the next room, and yet in spite of its cries, would not leave the dining room. Though her family had ruled these lands for 500 years, when she died in her 70s, she was the last of her line. In her will, she gave much to the poor, the staff and servants, her friends and her animals. Her large, funerary procession of locals carried her into the woods where she was interred in a Grecian 1700s family tomb where lay her father and brother, surrounded by nature and far from any buildings. Today, her house is said to be haunted by her ghost that wanders looking fruitlessly for her long-dead pets. Her tomb, in time, faded into obscurity with few ever visiting, becoming one with the forest, until one day it became almost forgotten. And here our mystery begins. Abandoned Tales from the Crypt, The Lost Lady of the Forest's Vault of Horror. As we travel down this faint trace of a path in search of her resting place, a Kipling poem comes to mind. They shut the road through the woods 70 years ago. Weather and rain have undone it again, and now you would never know there was once a path through the woods. Before they planted the trees, it is underneath the coppice and heath and the thin anemones. Only the keeper sees that where the ring dove broods and the badgers roll at ease, there was once a road through the woods. Where the otter whistles his mate, they fear not men in the woods because they see so few. You will hear the beat of a horse's feet and the swish of a skirt in the dew, steadily cantering through the misty solitudes as though they perfectly knew the old lost road through the woods. But there is no road through the woods. Beginning to despair of finding the end of the lost road, or that we had truly lost it along the way, 
I finally spied a color and shape in the trees, and slowing, an old and crumbling wall came into sight. It was square and certainly fit the profile of a cemetery. A gateway led inside the enclosure. Was this the lost tomb? A mound of falling stones and grass overgrown heaves into sight. Looking in all directions, it's clear this place is reclaimed by nature with not a sign of man. Walking to its ornate front, this is clearly the Lady of the Forest Tomb. A dark hole beckons inwards, and a stone block lies nearby. It's clear somebody has tried to get in. Our curiosity gets the better of us, and we decide to enter the darkness. Please be aware that what you are about to see may be shocking, but it's real, and I've always promised to show you everything, the good and the bad. Rusted gates greet us, twisted and bent downwards. On the floor, some refuse and a broken human pelvis. Through the gate, a room of casket shelving, empty. In the front area lies a casket, the wood broken from around it. The lead interior has been cut into and torn back. In the back a leg bone, a pelvis, and other smaller bones. The skull is missing. Higher above it, another casket lies smashed apart, the lead lining also ripped open. On the floor, a third casket similarly defiled. A skull cap, leg and arm bones, ribs, and other parts are still inside. The fine metalwork on the casket can still be seen. The slabs sealing the receptacle entrances have also been defaced. But here on the floor, I believe we have found the lost lady of the forest, caring and thoughtful in life, forgotten in death by visitors, now defiled by strangers. The position of the casket in a side shelf suggests the first two coffins in the front were the earliest burials. From research, we know both her father, the Earl, and her brother, also Earl, preceded her and were buried here first.
A look above at the top shelf shows the skull is gone here too, but the jaw was dropped by the robbers. This body is most likely Our Lady's father who built the tomb in the 1700s. His bones lie in a jumble in the broken coffin. It's a sad truth that a black market exists for human body parts. In most nations, one can only legally purchase them if they are grandfathered scientific specimens. I suspect the motive here was simple greed, an affront upon a woman who gave so much in life and left with so little. We glance around the interior. Despite the outward decay, there are no holes, no signs of water. The ceiling perfectly arches above, untouched. Every other funerary shelf lies empty. We look around to see if there's a sign of what the robbers left or plaques that have not been taken. Then we notice it in the Lady of the Forest coffin. We remember what we first saw earlier and turn back. We do the only thing we can. We pick up her broken pelvis, left carelessly discarded by the thieves. And we gently return one small part of her back to her resting place. Perhaps, in time again, she will find the peace she sought in life in her vast Gothic mansion, filled with her beloved animals who now surround her in this silent forest. Leaving this place, we're humbled by what we have found. It seems like there are life lessons to be learned, be it the transience of wealth or even our deeds. Sometimes it's an adventure that brings us to these places, and for some urban explorers, it's a sort of meditation, a reverence for the past, or the ability to leave this world for just a moment. It feels like today we have done so and found the next, and the Lady of the Forest has allowed us to share her lost story in life with you. But who is left to speak for her or say goodbye, but these words slowly fading on a grave in front of our eyes? When I am dead, my dearest, sing no sad songs for me. Plant thou no roses at my head, nor shady cypress tree. Be the green grass above me, with showers and dewdrops wet. And if thou wilt, remember, and if thou wilt, forget. I shall not see the shadows, I shall not feel the rain, I shall not hear the nightingale sing on as if in pain, and dreaming through the twilight that doth not rise nor set, haply I may remember, and haply may forget. Don't forget to subscribe and join us in our next exploration as we take you into the remnants of the Asylum of Seven Teeth and explore the infamous story of a horrific murder that haunts it to this very day.